So I'm Jeremy Brecker, uh, and I was here in Washington from 1965 to 1970. I was primarily based at the Institute for Policy Studies. I was a student and then promoted to uh, 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 being an associate fellow. Um, and I also worked for uh, Congressman Robert Kastenmeier, and I worked for the Friends Committee on National Legislation uh, for quite a while. Uh, and used to bill myself a, uh, a Quaker military expert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, this is Lessons of the 60s on October 13th, uh, 2013, interviewing Jeremy Brecker, a Washington activist. So I was in Washington most of the time from 1965 to 1970. I had been a student at Reed College and a student activist, and. Uh, had read about the Institute for Policy Studies and before that about the Liberal Caucus, which was founded by Arthur Wasco and uh, Marcus Raskin, who thereupon founded the Institute for Policy Studies. And when uh, Arthur Wasco came to my college and spoke, I said, how do I go to the Institute? And he said, well, write us a letter. Uh, and boom, uh, the next year I was a student at the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, it was an extremely interesting and educational place to be during the 1960s uh, because it was the interface between the social movements that were developing around the country and the world of power that Washington, D.C. represents. Um, so when I first got here, uh, one of the first experiences I had was uh, they said, oh, there's a demonstration for uh, a erase chalk. I said, what's erase chalk? They said, the guy who owns the trans public transportation system, the bus system, is the ultimate villain for uh, Washington, D.C., the greatest oppressor of poor people. His name's Roy Chalk, and we're having a demonstration to prevent the building of highways through neighborhoods and to campaign for public transportation uh, instead. Uh, nowadays, when I talk to uh, younger people in Washington and say, do you know why there is a metro in Washington? Did you know that once there was no public transportation except the bus system? Uh, and I find very often they know absolutely nothing about this story, but it's because of the emergency uh, Committee on the Transportation Crisis, ECTC, ECTC that Washington has its uh, uh, amazingly uh, nice and useful public transportation system. Uh, that was um, a, created because the city made the mistake of trying to put or whoever was pushing for the highway made the mistake of trying to put it through the house of an old organizer uh, who not only organized his neighbors to oppose it, but then went and made a coalition with inner city blacks uh, to fight for public transportation rather than just to stop the highway. And as they say, the rest is history. That would have been Sammy Abbott. Sammy Abbott, right. uh, uh, who uh, eventually became the mayor of Tacoma Park, but before that was uh, just a freelance uh, artist, uh, designer, uh, who led this struggle. Um, when did you get to walk to Washington again? 65. I, uh, 65. It would have been um, fall of 65. Um, and uh, so that was one of the first experiences I had, uh, and uh, the people that I knew just grabbed me up and took me to it. Um, and the other thing that I remember from the earliest days was the presence of Women's Strike for Peace. Uh, they had an extremely active uh, chapter in Washington. It may have been the first, certainly an early one. Uh, and they were pioneering a style of activism that I think we all have come to know since then. Uh, much more militant. I mean, it really was the the grandmother of Code Pink, uh, with much uh, direct action, much more in your face, and uh, uh, much more um, uh, kind of uh, freewheeling stylistically. Uh, 
than any of the uh, uh, movements, uh, either peace movements or women's movements that had preceded it. Um, so that, that was uh, uh, created a lot of the buzz in the atmosphere. Uh, also, uh, IPS was a Washington base for SNCC and was involved in a lot of activities. Um, of course, I got here a couple of years after the March on Washington and after many of the big civil rights uh, demonstrations in Washington. Uh, but there were people from SNCC who were using this as a base for, um, uh, for example, um, organizing co-ops and economic activities for black workers in the South. Um, so that was a, a significant part of it. And also they were making a push into the DC City Council uh, and into DC politics. People out of the, the um, chapter at uh, um, the, some of the major colleges in the district uh, were, had SNCC chapters and were running candidates and pushing into the political system. Um, then the uh, probably most dramatic activities uh, were around the Vietnam War and the resistance to the Vietnam War. Of course, Washington was the focus for the big national demonstrations. Uh, and uh, um, I could talk about that, but you probably have lots of people who can talk about that. Well, I would but, like to talk about that, but I'd like to say one other thing yeah. uh, uh, relating to when you got to Washington in 1965. That was also the same time that Marion Barry yes. and Snick came to Washington and became a, a local leader, indeed, in the, in the, the transportation fight. Because right. He was the one that uh, got people to pay their bus, uh, their bus uh, tolls in pennies to stay uh -huh. on the bus system. So you must have come right at the same yes. time. Yes, and, all that and that was the political yeah. things I was talking about, and the Howard... SNCC chapter was really a crucial, both his base of operations and, uh, and very important in developing a more militant civil rights movement here uh, with also the DC statehood campaign as a central piece of that. Uh, Reverend Fauntroy uh, and um, a gentleman I'm, whose name I'm forgetting who was, uh, worked for the city library, who was a very important leader in that um, in that effort, um, and a very, very strong sort of indigenous community leader for DC, uh, and specifically on the statehood campaign. Um, so that was all, you know, this stuff was all in the air very much. Well, one of the things that was interesting was, since there hadn't been any of these kinds of movements on this scale for a very, very long time, uh, we didn't really know what was happening. <laughs> you know, we didn't, now you can look back with historical perspective and say, oh, that was the 60s, and yeah. this is what happened, and it had a generational component, and a uh, racial component, and a sort of crisis in the ruling class component, so analyze it in those ways. We were just uh, making up the playbook as we went, uh, and that was part of the excitement of it, but also part of the reasons we had great difficulty and made some, some significant uh, uh, errors of judgment and mistakes along the way. Um, Tell me about the big peace demonstrations that you uh, went to as soon as you got here. Well, the, the, I, even before I got here, I came down for um, uh, the first one was right after Kennedy was elected in, I'm going to say, 61. I have to check the dates. Um, but it was organized by a group at Harvard called Toxin in alliance with the Student Peace Union, which was the first beginning of a, of a student uh, peace movement at that time. Um, and then, uh, uh, and that, then, uh, uh, and I believe that um, uh, Mark Raskin was involved in the reception. Uh, he was in the Kennedy administration at that point and was involved in seeing that uh, the students who came had some uh, opportunity to talk with government officials and so on. Uh, then very f relatively soon after that, there was another demonstration against uh, what was then appeared to be an impending 
uh, attack on Cuba. Well, it was uh, for, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Actually, there was one also uh, about uh, in Bay of Pigs. Um, I and I can't remember whether I actually got down here for that, but then in, in my student networks in, in Connecticut, we would come down whenever there was a Washington demonstration. We, would, we were part of the hinterland that floated down. Uh, I missed the march on Washington, but my mother attended it in 63. Yeah. Uh, and then I can't give you the date, but uh, as uh, was mentioned, you mentioned before, um, the first major demonstration, national demonstration against the Vietnam War was organized by SDS. SDS in April 65. April 60, I thought it was 65. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, uh, that we thought it, when there were uh, maybe 20,000 yeah. people at it, uh, we thought the revolution had broken out. I had studied the history of student movements and radical movements. Uh, and I never expected in my lifetime to see anything like that. I didn't know we were going to be putting a million people on the green against the war uh, within uh, three or four years. Um, so, uh, and that, that's part of why I say we didn't know what, we, we had no historical handle on what it was that was happening and what we were doing. We just knew we had to do it. Um, I, the, so Washington, of course, played an important role. Uh, and Washington activists played an important role as part of the organizing base that made some of those marches possible. Um, there were a series, I had come out of SDS and been very active in SDS, we, uh, but by the time I was in Washington, SDS was already um, in its kind of both extremely rapid growth and proliferation, but also internal disintegration. So we had an SDS chapter uh, it was more or less based at uh, Institute for Policy Studies, but it involved a lot of people who weren't uh, there. It was an at-large chapter. It didn't have a particular university base. Uh, and people in it played a role uh, in a number of efforts. Uh, in fact, um, uh, there was a kind of floating coordinating committee. It went under various names uh, over the course of the decade. But uh, the Nas National Committee to End the War in Vietnam and the MOB, the mobilization and the new MOB and so on, they were all essentially uh, just a continuing ad hoc leadership for the anti-war movement. Uh, and a lot of the Washington activists were involved with that. Um, uh, James Bevel, uh, who was one of the leaders in SCLC, moved to Washington and set up uh, his operation in, in, uh, to uh, be the leadership for that at one point, but it had before and after also. Uh, Dave Dellinger played a significant role on it and was based down here a lot uh, in that period. And a lot of the Washington folks, one way or another, because it was so open and ad hoc, played a, a, a disproportionate role in kind of staffing and helping lead those, those efforts. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, by the time you get to the later 1960s, you're getting to the, the huge uh, uh, moratorium demonstrations, uh, which were, um, uh, and maybe you're talking 70, 71. Um, and um, that, that really represented just an extraordinary mass outpouring of opposition to the war across the country that focused for a while on, in those actions. Um, and in Washington, I should say that the anti-war sentiment and to some extent organization spread and spread and spread. So for example, there were groups in uh, various government agencies. There were anti-war groups that formed. Now, uh, the um, NIH had one of the main ones, uh, but there were others also uh, where it was spreading into workplaces and that, those, that, that kind of uh, uh, sectoral spread. Uh, and that's something that certainly should be talked with. I know uh, Irene 
Wasco Elkin was a leader in that. If you ever want to, she's one person that you could talk to about that who I think would be well worth talking to. She's now out in the Midwest, but she, she has strong memories and so on about it. Um, the, another thing that should also definitely be kept in mind is that some of the early development of the women's liberation movement took place in Washington. Um, and uh, in the environment of the New Left and SDS, uh, the, there were early efforts to uh, articulate what were initially seen as just you know, another logical part of what SDS and the New Left were about, uh, that of course equal, you know, equal treatment for women and women's self-organization would be natural just like for any other constituency, met a surprising amount of opposition. Uh, women were harassed and jeered at meetings and things like that. And part of the development of the independent women's movement actually emerged from that in the late 60s, 69, 70. Uh, very first in SNCC, but very rapidly within SDS and with the emergence of women's caucuses in SDS. And there were a number of people in DC. Unfortunately, I can't give you names right off, although uh, uh, Marilyn Salzman Webb and Heather Booth Actually, I can give you those, those two names. Uh, and I worked with them a little bit um, because they wanted to do outreach to labor. And we went to some meetings. And they wanted some, some men to go along to show that it wasn't an anti-male uh, development. Uh, and so I went to some meetings with them. One was to the Labor Education Local 189, I remember, uh, and some others to try to support uh, um, the well, we rapidly found was an emerging women's movement. Um, and I think um, uh, the uh, one other thing I should mention is this was the, also the era of um, the black uh, uprisings or riots or whatever you want to call them. Uh, in far as Washington was concerned, <clears throat> There was, during the summers uh, of 65 and through 67 or 68, every weekend there would be tear. If you went to someplace like Columbia Road, uh, there were, you could smell the tear gas. There was uh, attempting to control uh, uh, movements, unorganized, uh, but uh, protest activity, riots uh, in black communities in DC. And then uh, uh, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, the military occupation of the city in response to the riots. Uh, I remember waking up uh, and seeing military vehicles coming in down my little one lane, one way street, uh, Corcoran Street which became very fa uh, fashionable, but at that time was a, a very poor ghetto street, um, and uh, basically the military occupation of the city. There were some rather, uh, uh, let's say, quixotic efforts uh, by some of the, uh, there, were, there were what became weatherman uh, folks in Washington at that time. Some of them were actually around the Institute for Policy Studies to some extent. Kathy Wilkerson would be one name, and there were some others. Uh, and they actually decided that they would go out and try to start a white riot in another part of Washington in order to try to divert the police from suppressing the, the black riots. Um, uh, that gives you some sense of the milieu and the atmosphere that Weatherman and some of the those types of uh, activities and, and way of thinking came out of. Um, and, um, Did they do it? Well, they, my impression is they went out there and they didn't find that the masses were prepared to uh, give them a lot of support. Um, but you, you need to talk to them because I, just, I, sort of, I was at one, there was a forum that was called at uh, IPS of, concerning how to respond to the riots. Uh, and that was one of the positions that was taken, let's put it that way. <laughs>
Um, so um, I think that this is a, oh, one, just one other thing I should say is that there was a lot of effort to do interracial activities in Washington communities. Uh, uh, I lived part of the time in Adams Morgan and Mark Raskin uh, and uh, Arthur Wasco lived on Wyoming Avenue and were very involved with um, the, a cultural center that was called The New Thing uh, and uh, running Topper Carew. Yes, uh, Topper Carew and Wasco too was our uh, 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 parody of, there was a famous political slogan, uh, uh, Tippy Canoe and so uh, uh, Topper Carew and Wasco too was, of course Arthur as a historian came up with that one. Um, and um, uh, so there was a, a lot of effort uh, and I think some of the uh, what Adams Morgan became as a cultural, uh, multicultural center. I'm not going to say it was caused by that, but let's say the door was kept open. It, when they went, f when they first, when first came to Washington, Adams Morgan was one of the few integrated communities anywhere in the city, and so a lot of progressive people gravitated to there, uh, and so it continued. So the activities that they participated in, I, I, let's say it helped keep the door open to it being a culturally mixed, uh, relatively unsegregated community. Um, to wrap this up, can yep. you quickly uh, tell me what, what you think your years, your five very active years in Washington did for the rest of your life? How did it affect or direct uh, the rest of your life? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure that I, maybe if I have a few more decades to reflect on it, I could, uh, could answer it better. It was a, a tremendous uh, educational experience. It was a tremendous interface between different things that were going, different aspects of the, of the society. Um, uh, I personally decided uh, that I wanted to go out to America. And I wanted to go back to the, the town that I had come from and uh, connect with people who were outside of Washington, who were not part of what was inevitably a very hothouse atmosphere. And so for the subsequent many decades, uh, while I've come to Washington for demonstrations and brought my family to Washington for demonstrations, I've come here for conferences, I've come here to do things with the Institute for Policy Studies and with other uh, activist groups, uh, but I made the decision that I, my base was going to be not here, but, uh, but out in the hinterland, and I've lived in the same community, um, all except for one, a couple of years, uh, ever since I left Washington and sunk in my roots there. Um, so uh, that, that's one piece of it. I'm not saying that I was right or that anyone else should have that attitude about it, but I, that was part of what I learned was that I didn't want to be, uh, uh, spend my entire life uh, uh, in that hothouse political atmosphere. Um, instead, I've been just as much of an activist uh, since as I was then. Um, but I think I left with a, val a sense of the value of there being that kind of interface. Uh, it's just I wanted to be more on one side of that than the other. Um, I think that the uh, unpredictability of uh, mass movements, of their rising and their uh, decline, uh, was something that I had the opportunity to observe up close. And it's helped me uh, understand and be able to participate more creatively in something like Occupy Wall Street recognizing that it probably was going to be an upsurge and then uh, probably not going to become the new AFL-CIO or something like that, and probably better than it not. Um, uh, but, uh, so, but I got to get, to get a sense of how social movements uh, interface with other aspects of life in, in complex kinds of time, time frames. Um, I learned 
uh, that um, uh, attitudes and positions that are taken extreme with extreme passion and certainty uh, at one time, uh, a year or two later, the people who held them may be in a very different place. Uh, and this is really useful in terms of working in the long run. Uh, you may disagree now, or you may say, well, they're really off the beam. Uh, but you may turn out that uh, uh, something very different is uh, um, the people who were your opponents two years ago are your allies today and vice versa. Um, uh, and I learned that a, f a, a free-flowing environment of ideas and experimental action uh, uh, where people are able to put uh, strategies and hypotheses out and have them be uh, taken up for a while and played with and tried out and tested uh, is both an extremely exciting way to live and also a very creative way to address the problems of making social change. Thank you. You're yep. a historian by, uh, by, uh, by I, I am, uh, I'm basically a freelance writer. Ah, okay. So um, but I, I've done, uh, I've written a lot of history yeah. books and I'm, did, I was, uh, human, uh, I did a, a long, long series of um, uh, kind of public television uh, shows on Connecticut history topics that I was, some of them I was the producer, but most of them I was the sort of the content person oh, yeah. for. And then I did a long, long running series of oral history based radio programs for Connecticut okay. Public Radio. They, they, they didn't go national, yeah. but they were, uh, they were very Connecticut. Well, I'll, t I'll tell one that I thought was very, that, uh, uh, and it will be interesting to see. It interfaces with other things, I'm sure, uh, with things, something, an event that I'm sure other people will tell you about also from different perspectives. Um, so, uh, and it has to do with one of the big Pentagon uh, demonstrations, like uh, 67 or 68. 67 was um, I, I wish I could tell you, uh, 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 the marker was, actually maybe it was later because it was after, I could talk about 67, but lots of people can yeah. tell you about that. Uh, this was right after the invasion of Cambodia, so when, 70. so it's 70. Maybe 70. Um, and I was actually just getting ready to leave. That's, that's when I left, but, um, uh, and it was after the, I was after the Panther, right, but it was all in the context of the Panther trial in New Haven. Um, and uh, it was huge, and it was also at a, uh, a point of um, uh, where the anti-war movement and also the um, uh, the Panthers and the various emerging black power yes. sectors uh, were really uh, an explosive situation, both explosive in numbers and outreach and explosive in terms of um, moving toward a, a more violent forms of confrontation. Um, and so uh, what I was doing was uh, attempting to foment a general strike uh, and uh, we were reaching out to the groups that were uh, organizing um, in, the go in government and other occupations. Uh, and um, we were uh, uh, re uh, also, it was the time, this was, it's now often not known, but this was a big period of uh, labor confrontation in the United States, especially 70 to 72. Uh, and there was, in fact, a huge uh, um, uh, strike, wildcat strike of postal workers. And there, so we were also trying to push uh, for other strikes by other government workers as part of the same 
thing. I would now regard this as a very quixotic effort uh, and pretty abstract uh, uh, effort uh, without actually understanding the politics of how, how these things actually happen and, and emerge. So, that's, so from, from my, in terms of self-criticism, I would say it was rooted in a, uh, I would say this would be an illustration of abstract lefty politics, pretty much. Um, uh, and, but um, if you want to know something about the postal worker strike and some of these efforts, there's um, uh, a section about it in my labor history book, Strike. And also, the story that I'm, I'm telling now, I, <clears throat> I wrote up in a, a book called um, uh, Save the Humans, uh, Common Preservation in Action, which is quasi-autobiographical, and it has uh, quite a bit about some of, the, some of these things during the period I was in Washington. So that's just a reference that m may be something to have in your collection or take a look at. Um, the, 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 some of the early women's, women's liberation things in Washington are in there. Some of, the, some of the peace movement things are in there. Some of the things I've been talking about, in other words, are, are in uh, Save the Humans. Um, so what, uh, what actually happened uh, was uh, not a general strike, but the, as people poured into Washington, uh, basically the Nixon administration played a trick. They refused to give any permits. Uh, they made the whole thing seem like it was going to be a huge confrontation. And then at the last minute, they, and, and all the people uh, who were coming in were girded up for extremely militant responses and occupations and stuff like that. And then at the last, last, and they were negotiating uh, with the peace movement leadership right up to the last minute. And then all of a sudden, at the last minute, they gave all the permits, and all the steam went out of the uh, um, uh, demonstration, and it became uh, just just another big demonstration with a lot of people, but not the kind of confrontation that was uh, being looked for either by the people who wanted a violent con confrontation or by the ones who wanted a mass nonviolent type confrontation. The one group that was truly successful in, uh, in that setting, in my, from what I could see, in 1970. this is 1970, and I'm passing out flyers with backing from Dave Dellinger, who was head of the, at that point was the chair of the MOB, new MOB or MOB or whichever mm -hmm. one it was. Uh, uh, darn good pamphlet, but pretty abstract relative to what was actually going on. The Peace Corps volunteers uh, had their own anti-war network, and they came into Washington, uh, and they went out and occupied the Peace Corps headquarters and shut up everything and um, barricaded themselves in there. Uh, and uh, you'd have to go back and check, but I, my impression is that then led other people to go and just find buildings, uh, government buildings that were open, that they could get into, and go in and occupy them. Uh, and the Peace Corps volunteers stayed in for quite a long time until they were threatened with really serious uh, uh, repercussions. And the others lasted from a few hours to a day or two. But that, that was the one case where people actually were able to make it be something more than just uh, uh, a big demonstration, which under normal circumstances would be fine, but in this incredibly uh, conflicted and heating, heated atmosphere where the population had, was swinging radically against the war, but people didn't know how, what was the next step, and how do you push it on to the next step? Those people who were had concrete uh, drive and motivation to do that were the ones who actually were able to do something that pushed it to a next step. Uh, neither me with my calls for general strike nor the people who were trying to push violent confrontations and stuff like that, uh, we, were, we were basically not, uh, didn't, were neither wise nor effective in what we were trying to do. So I would just give that as one example. It's not a, uh, uh, and I, I, I give it partially because it's a, a self-critique 
uh, as much as a, as a critique of others. And I think that's one of the things I've learned uh, is movements strengthen themselves by thinking about what they've done wrong, and so do individuals. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank it's you. delighted to be able to do